Thank you, Nick. Hello again. Um, this is a great start. I'm, I'm much happier than last time. Um, I'm uh, going to talk today on behalf of the core team and just say a few words um, about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about where Rust is right now and where we hope Rust is going to be going over the next year. But I, I just want to start by saying a few words about the conference. Um, I've been having like a, a really excellent time. There's been some fantastic talks on just a really kind of diverse array of topics, and that's been uh, a real pleasure to listen to. And it's been really great to get to, to meet a lot of you. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it, although this is the end of the technical program, we have a, uh, there's a couple more days of, of workshops to go. Um, so I hope you'll get to stick around and enjoy some of those. I know I'm looking forward to, to those as well. And oh, nah, thank you. Uh, this is okay. <laughs> um, and I just want to say thank you. There's so much effort that goes into producing a conference like this. And if everything goes well, you don't really notice. Um, but I, I know that um, it, it really takes a lot of hard work um, to, to get a, a conference up and going. Um, so I want to, to start by saying thank you to the, to the organizers, um, Cryptake and, and Pincap, um, and in particular to Amy and Anna, uh, who have done like a, a huge amount of work behind the scenes to, to make all this work. So thank you, organizers. <clears throat> Um, and I, the, without the sponsors, there would be no conference. So I'm very appreciative of the, um, the, the sponsors. So thank you. <laughs> and um, the staff who are working here, and the translators, and everyone who has given a talk or will give a workshop. Um, and all the attendees. If there are no attendees, there is no conference. So thank you for giving up your weekend and, and coming to, to listen to, to Rust. <laughs> and both personally and on behalf of the, um, the kind of Rust leadership, we're, I'm very happy that this conference is, is happening um, and happening here. Uh, I think that uh, China and Asia have <laughs> Um, really large, active Rust communities, um, and it's really great that there's a that we have the this conference here now as well. Um, and this is you know Rust is getting more global, more international. Just last month we had the first conference in uh, Latin America. At the end of last year, the first conference in Russia, um, as well as kind of some of the the slightly older conferences going on in the U.S. and Europe. And we've got, and meetups are happening now in 42 different countries. And just like um, this conference, and just like most of the other conferences, these are all kind of community driven, uh, homegrown um, events. And it's, uh, and it's just really great that um, this, is, this is happening. Um, and, I, and I look forward to, to, um, to for this happening more and to have kind of a, a, a better relationship between the various kind of international Rust communities. And in fact, that's um, one of the key priorities for the community team this year is to improve internationalization and improve work with the international communities. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself talking about 2019. Um, I'll talk about 2018 first. Um, so 2018 was a good year. Uh, we released the 2018 edition. Uh, which was very exciting. Uh, this is a, a key part of um, Rust's policy of stability without stagnation. And uh, what that means is we want Rust to keep improving, to keep getting better, but um, we don't want to do that if it means breaking your code. And uh, the, the 2018 edition is an opportunity for us to kind of future-proof the next few years from improve, um, improvements uh, and kind of deprecate some of the, the stuff that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, but we've managed to do this pretty much without breaking backwards compatibility because it, 
because you've had to opt in to the 2018 edition. And uh, even if you um, don't opt in, then 2015 crates and 2018 crates can interoperate very, very smoothly. Um, you, you don't need to worry if one of your upstream dependencies has gone ahead to the 2018 edition, but you don't want to yet. Or likewise, you don't need to worry if, um, uh, if your upstream crates has not moved on to the 2018 edition. You can um, go ahead with yours. And if you do have breaking changes, there's a, a tool, Cargo Fix, which will help you address nearly all of those automatically. So what was actually in the 2018 edition? Uh, I think it was quite a, an exciting bunch of features. On the language side, we've um, we got non-lexical lifetimes, which makes the borrow checker just a little bit less frustrating. We uh, added stable support for a, um, not all, but a, a wide um, uh, selection of procedural macros, which are an extremely powerful feature. Uh, uh, we improved the ergonomics of match. I talked about this a little bit yesterday. And we made some improvements to the module system. So hopefully you, you won't have to use extern crates anymore, for example. Uh, we shipped 1.0 versions of Rust Format and Clippy, which are two very popular tools in the, in the Rust ecosystem. And we made great progress on IDE support, and we um, shipped the Cargo Fix tool that I just talked about, without which I think the um, addition would have been uh, a much harder sell, like much, much more friction in, in moving from 2015 to 2018. And we also had some uh, domain working groups focusing on the domains um, WebAssembly, um, uh, embedded computing, uh, command line interfaces, and networking. And uh, all these uh, domains make great progress last year. So overall, my feeling now is that Rust is a working language. It's, I mean, it's still a relatively new language, but it doesn't feel like a really out there, risky choice to make if you're choosing a programming language. Uh, it's certainly not experimental anymore. It's certainly not a toy anymore. It's, it's a language you can get real work done. And the 2018 survey backs that up. I just want to talk about a few of the highlights from the 2018 survey to give you an idea of where the Rust community is right now. <clears throat> So we had responses from 6,000 people, which is a, a, a new high. I think it's great that the, the, the number of respondents is tracking up every year. 30% of those respondents use Rust professionally at work. And again, this is tracking up year on year. So we see Rust being taken. Uh, it's not just early adopters kind of learning it in their own time. It's, uh, you know, a, l a lot of people are using it to get work done. And 25% of respondents are working on code bases which are 10,000 lines or more, uh, which is kind of like a medium to large code base, but this shows that, like, it's not just toys, it's not just experiments or prototypes. We're getting work done on serious projects. This is a really interesting um, chart to me. Uh, this is how long have you been working with Rust? And what's interesting is that about a quarter, about 25% of respondents have been using Rust for two years or more. And approximately the same, about 25% again, have been using Rust for less than three months. And what that shows to me is that we are still getting lots of new users. Lots of people are still coming to Rust. And at the same time, lots of people are still sticking around. People are not trying it for six months and moving on to you know, the next hot language. They're sticking with Rust. And uh, I think the... Um, the, the survey number I'm most proud of is this one, is that uh, only 2% of respondents felt unwelcome in the Rust community. And, you know, given what a lot of internet communities are like, this is a really great result, I think. 
I, I'm much less proud that this, um, uh, this number has a lot of regional variation. So in China, the number was 8%. You know, it's a lot higher. And I, uh, I, I really hope that we can do better uh, this year and going forward to try and get the, uh, the Chinese community in particular kind of like more a part of the international community and feeling more welcome. My final highlight from the, um, from the survey is 93% of respondents have never experienced a backward compatibility issue. And given this core principle that I mentioned earlier, stability um, uh, without stagnation, this is a really important part of that. This is a, a really big number of people who are getting the guarantee that we want them to get. And uh, the remaining 7%, nearly all of those were very minor, easy to fix problems. We had very few people complaining about like serious backwards compatibility issues. So, it sounds great. So we can head to the beach, get a book, time to relax. Uh, no, we, um, we, we've still got a lot to do. Um, there's still a lot of improvements we can make. And so, uh, let's talk about 2019. Uh, there, we recently um, accepted uh, an RFC laying out the uh, 2019 roadmap, and there will be a blog post about that uh, hopefully next week. The overall theme for, for 2019 is about maturity. I mentioned earlier that I feel like Rust is feeling like a more you know, mature language where you can get serious work done, and we want to take that even further. It's time to, to really kind of like make using Rust a serious thing. And uh, part of that is taking some time and reflecting on uh, ways in which we can set us up to continue to grow and continue to do so in a, in a good way rather than kind of losing some of the uh, good things that we have at the moment. And a key part of that is about governance. How is the project run? How, what are the, um, the leadership structures? Because over the last three years, Rust has grown in, immensely. It's, a, it's got a huge number of users now, and we have to make our governance structures scale with the growth of the community. An example of this is the RFC process. The RFC process is great. It means that we can do uh, all of our design work in the open. Nearly every decision that, or every significant decision which is made um, in the Rust project is made via the RFC process and is made in the open. But we've gone through nearly 1,300 RFCs um, uh, since the, we, we started the process around kind of 1.0 time, just before 1.0. And like we've well passed the point where one person can keep track of every RFC discussion. In fact, we're pretty much pa past the point where you can keep an eye on, say, all the language RFCs or all the library RFCs, even if you're working full time on Rust, which a great number of people in the community aren't. And even if you want to focus on just like a few pro uh, RFCs, some of the discussions, you know, we're seeing nearly 700 comments. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of discussion to keep track of. And so this year, we really need to, to grow some new ways of doing things. We need to, to develop new processes, uh, create new teams, new working groups. Uh, reevaluate how the existing teams and working groups are growing and evolving. We also want to address um, long standing requests. There are some items that have been around in some cases since before 1.0, um, and that we know basically how to fix them, but we just haven't got around to fixing them. Um, here, here's a list. Um, of some of the things uh, uh, on our mind. So, custom allocators. This is a, a big demand for people writing large systems, uh, um, especially more low-level projects. Um, async await for asynchronous programming. Uh, I probably don't need to say anything about that. It's a, it's a pretty well-known feature by now. 
Um, constant generics, generic associated types, specialization, these are all um, kind of big ticket language items. They're all, um, the design is pretty much done for all, all of these things. And in most cases, the implementation is pretty much done. We just need to get some of the wrinkles out and stabilize it. And custom registries in cargo is another uh, big ticket item um, that we, <laughs> we need to get done. And the third theme for the year is polish. Although by now, you know, the, the, the shape of Rust is really set, we're not gonna see any big changes, right? We're not gonna announce this year that we're giving up on ownership and that garbage collection is the way forward. But there are like lots of places where we can polish some more rough edges off. We can make things better. Um, IDE support, compile times, documentation, ergonomics, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of places that I can hope we can make small but significant improvements. Okay, that's everything that I have. Um, I, uh, I hope you're kind of excited for what's gonna happen this year. I know that I am, and um, I hope you uh, are able to attend some of the workshops and, and enjoy those. And um, please, if any of this stuff is interesting, come find me over the next couple of days and, and have a chat. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a volunteer, and uh, um, I, have a, I have a last technical question, and really quick. Uh, sure. As a core team member, can you recommend an IDE uh, or um, text <laughs> editor for the rest of the Rust community? Because, you know, the, um, the IDE uh, for Rust is not, uh, it is less mature than the, the other language like Python or Java. So what, sure. what would you recommend for the rest of us? I, I would recommend using the editor you like. I, I know that if I tell an Emacs user to use Vim or a Vim user to use Emacs, it won't be popular. Um, if, if you like a very um, full-featured IDE, then IntelliJ has great support for Rust. Um, a lot of the um, IntelliJ features that are available for, uh, say, Java or Scala or whatever, you, you get for Rust as well. If you like a, a more lightweight IDE, um, VS Code is pretty good. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic editor, and the Rust support is pretty good if you have a fairly small project. Um, uh, I am a big fan of more uh, lightweight editors like Sublime Text or um, Atom, cool. both of which have kind of syntax highlighting and um, can support the, the RLS if you like having more information like that around. But really, like, choosing an editor is such a personal choice that I, I, I wouldn't recommend one over another. I'd say more stick to the editor you'd like and the, the support will be there. Maybe not you know, as good as you're used to in Java or something, but there's, there's stuff there. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Okay. Uh, just, just super short question. Is Ferris going to be uh, an official mascot? Uh, deliberately, no. Um, we, it's uh, because kind of logos and trademarks and so off, it's so on. It gets very boring and legal, and um, uh, it's nice to have a mascot which is not official and with which you can do whatever you like. So if you want to make your own version of Ferris, knock yourself out. Like, go ahead. Uh, make your own toy, make badges, whatever. We, yeah, it's, um, it is the Rust community logo. It's not official in any kind of legally meaningful way. <laughs> uh, okay, Jeho, you go. Last one. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, I'm pretty excited <laughs> for uh, 2019 uh, for Rust. Um, so one of the uh, problems that I often face at my workplace, which is uh, really just me using Rust <laughs> right now, is how t exactly do I introduce Rust to my colleagues. Uh, do you have any tips for that? Uh, 
I can point you at a great talk all about that um, that sh I think is on uh, YouTube. I think uh, I will have to, to look it up. But yeah, I think there was a talk at RustConf last year about this, or maybe the, the year before, like going into some uh, a bunch of stuff that works and a bunch of stuff that might not work. Um, it, I think it depends very much who you're trying to um, sell it to. I would say very different things to your CTO versus like another engineer. Um, but kind of the... I mean, the, the kind of like the higher order bit is that if you need performance and if you need, um, you know, low memory usage or you can't tolerate garbage collection, then Rust will make you much more productive than other languages. By using Rust, you'll have write less bugs, you will spend less time debugging, um, and that is a, a huge reward. Thanks a lot.